Okay, hi all. Today's uh, video is going to be focused on part two of Ransom. We're going to start at page 49 and we're going to head through to uh, about page 61 to 62. And this section is um, Priam talking to his wife, Hecuba. So he's just had this vision of the cart and um, the plain uh, white robes, wearing the robes and going and ransoming um, his son's body back from Achilles. And um, so now he realizes he has to face Hecuba and he has to be bold, defiant and sure to face his very um, formidable wife. Um, and so it begins with a description of her who is like Priam, has been sleepless her hair's been awry, she's um, she's racked with grief and there's a physical description of her grief there. Um, if you turn over the page here, um, they there's a description of their relationship and they do seem to have had a tenderness in their relationship that they have shared. Um, we can see a physical description of the aged body by the veins with the liver colored spots the imagery there uh, creating a sense of imagination of the elderly couple um, and her grief is emphasizes grief is emphasized here through not only the swollen eyelids um, but the weeping And Priam starts to petition her. Um, so it's been 11 days, we've done nothing, we've just sat here, been stunned with grief. Um, and now he's both basically saying, come on, let's act. Um, and page 51, you'll see her uh, fierce anger. Her tears are not of grief, but of anger. She says fury even that she is a woman and can do nothing but sit here and rage and weep while the body of my son after 11 days of, and nights is still out there. So um, I noted the the role of women in this um, ancient Greek society being quite powerless um, and the fact that the body... It's quite significant that it has not had that ritual that's allowed after the death. Um, and her rage towards Achilles is um, evident. She describes him as a butcher. And she wants to tear out his hair, his heart and eat it raw. <laughs> so the violence of her um, anger. Um, and then Priam says... Um, and this is, again, Priam's internal monologue, his reflection. So much of the action here happens through, is propelled forward through the internal reflections of the characters. And here he um, describes her as a woman that he has known and not known for so many years. And it was perhaps the fierceness of her response here that is revealing a quality about her that is unknown. Um and then it launches into a section at the top of 52 where she describes that um, Hector is significant because um, she carried him. She, um, she held him in her body um, and then I wrote at the side my annotation basically said that her sons are still like babies in her memory, um, that she feels like it's her flesh that's being tumbled. So she feels Hector's, the pain to Hector's body like it's hers. Um, she's lost seven children or seven sons in this particular war. Um, and then there's a description of the labour. Uh, 18 hours with Hector. So she's still, um, those, those sons of hers are her babies. They're precious to her. Um, and Priam's, unco Priam's uncomfortable with this. 
the talk unnerves him because it's not his sphere. And I think that's probably a good quote, although it's not highlighted, but I'm just circling it now, that it's not his sphere. And those idea, the idea of spheres, the different worlds that um, characters inhabit, where the what role they play in these spheres is quite a significant one that's emphasised. Okay, so... And that idea continues, that idea of the roles that we play continues on page 53. If you see over the side here, um, he talks about his role as a king and his role was not as a warrior, but his role was to hold himself apart in ceremonial stillness. I like that quote, the ceremonial stillness, and others become his arm or um take action on his behalf the herald at his side finds words for him um, and the herald's role becomes important later on um, and if we go back a little bit to 52 he also here um, sorry for jumping around there but he he doesn't remember he the significance of the birth of his children for example those 18 hours of labor and all of those details so what he recognizes is the squall small squalling bundles that are presented to him um like an offering so his children are significant to him because they need to be recognized as his and blessed into his household but not necessarily for their individual contribution necessarily for their individuality for who they are and so uh, coming back to 54 over this side um, Priam's age is also recognized that his voice has thinned and his world has become shaky or the, his grip has become shaky. But what's really significant for him is that he is perceived as, and I guess that value of how he is perceived um, and his symbolic role. Yeah. Um, and he needs to be seen as a king as unchanged as fixed and permanent in order to present his um i guess that kingship um he doesn't hide anything from his wife of course but to the citizens they have to see him as the great palm priam um and it here again i probably think it's worth highlighting that ceremonial figurehead and if he is okay, then everything else in the kingdom is okay. So he is fixed. Um, but then he goes on to now introduce this idea to his wife, Hecuba, that he has had a vision. Um, and he describes that vision, the two black mules, the cart, the simple cart, no kingship signs, no amulet. Um, and he describes how he's um you know he sees the vision of him going to uh, ransom his son um and Hecuba is shocked and disturbed and um Hecuba throughout her life has often interpreted his dreams remember saying that um he's dreamed he's vis had visions from the gods and and spoken to the gods so she's many times, many years of marriage um, helped him to deal with these visions and she attempts to reply. She normally would, but he is resolute. Um, he describes the treasure and the wagon and then on page 56 um, that it's got all of his treasury, um, description of the treasury there. Um, and a significant quote to notice in 56 that the son Hector's body is 
replacing the treasury. So we have the treasury and then suddenly it's Nam daytime. It's no longer night and his son's body has replaced the uh, treasury and is being restored and ransomed. Um, I liked the use of alliteration there in the double R. Maybe something you can notice. Um, intended by Malouf or otherwise. And so he immediately intends to do, as you can see, so this is what I intend to do, to go today immediately. And so much of the action in this story happens immediately, like it's honestly happening over a 36-hour period between the time when um, he ha has, so Achilles stands on the beach looking out and then Priam has this vision and then they take action and goes to get the body. It, it, it's a, um, a short novel in the sense of the action itself does not, it takes place only in a, a very short amount of time. It's immediately he plans to go. Not, and here is another significant quote, as an ordinary man, a father, um, so not as a king. Um and that's significant because in the previous section we've just seen the description of the significance of his role of king and how he has to be fixed and permanent, he can't change. But what he's suggesting now is an um, a extreme change. Um, and he plans to beg humbly on his knees to give back the body of his son. And Hecuba reacts here. Um, she immediately shows her anger um, and describes Achilles as a jackal, a bully. Um, and there's a description, a description here at the bottom of 56 of the brutality of Ach um, Achilles and um, the, how Hector nobly um, agreed or um, suggested that they would respect each other's bodies, whoever lost, and Achilles ignored it. Um, and, and if we turn over to 58, um, continue, Hecuba continues describing Achilles as a violator of every law of gods and men. Um, but Priam then says he doesn't expect it, but he believes it's possible. Uh, there's a sense of hope there in the tone. Um, and he believes that this is the thing that is needed to cut this knot. That's a good metaphor there that's used. Um, is there something new, something impossible? Some quotes there that you should really highlight. Um, and so she recognises that he's spoken with assurance. Uh, perhaps he's not normally so resolute um, and she needs all of her wiles, her powers of persuasion, firm but calm persuasion, to lead him away from this idea that she thinks is just crazy. Um, but he suggests that perhaps the gods might be on his side if it's their intention. Um, she describes it as folly and they're, they're debating back and forth um, and, and Priam continues to persuade or attempt to attempt to persuade her. Um, it'd be cool to do perhaps a language analysis of how um, the persuasive techniques that he's using but here anyway he describes it as just the fact that has never been done that it is unthinkable novel which means new um, is the reason why he thinks it should be attempted. I kind of like this quote too, that it is possible because it is not possible um, and it's so simple. So he's going as a man, what any man. Um, and this is another theme, that man versus king, the symbolic kingship versus the ordinary humanity. Um, and uh, it's reinforced throughout um, the play, the play, the the novel, and later on with the arrival of the character of Somax, you'll see that a lot more clearly. Um, and perhaps that is the real ransom: is him as a man, king. Hmm, just thinking, the king goes and the man comes back in his place. Perhaps there's a ransom there too. And. 
here, the top of 61, um, Priam talks about chance. Remember that his mind has just been blown by that idea of chance, that perhaps things don't happen always by the will of the gods for a reason. Perhaps there is something such as chance. And here he articulates this thought that he has had for the first time with the visit of Iris the god that perhaps he says that maybe what we call fortune and we think or we attribute to the will or the whim of the gods, what we think is what the gods are planning is not necessarily that, that there might be another way of naming or thinking about it that gives us an opening, an opening to act, an opportunity to act for ourselves. And I think here the theme and the idea that is reinforced is the importance of action, being able to take action, to try something that might force events into a different course. So a couple of two-word quotes you can use there. So it is the chance that allows Priam to act. And Hecuba is just shocked by this. She wishes, wishes she's misheard. Um, so it's inconceivable in her world that such a thing as chance um, would exist. And here she needs the help of her son. So she tries to put him off by saying, well, this plan of yours, well, if you want to go through with this whole crazy plan of going to ransom the body, let's take it to Helenus, her son, who's the um, the priest, um, and to the council, and let's actually consult, let's, let's talk. And she's actually hoping to buy a bit of time um, and convince him through her sons. Um, let's, let's ask them. Um, let's think about um, them. And then here at the top of 62, she talks about that other thing. She doesn't want to even allow herself to use his word. And that word is chance. Um, so it's another theme. It's worth really taking notes on. Um, this idea you're so taken with that perhaps we can act for ourselves, that we actually have a choice, um, that this idea is not something that you can even speak of, um, that it would lead to chaos if it were permitted to be thought of, that it would be so random, so violent, people would panic. So you have to keep that strictly to yourself. Um, and... I'm going to stop there. We're going to go into the section here um, from 62 from here down where um, Priam recounts his childhood and a significant event of his childhood that he's never shared with anybody before, including his wife. And that event actually, um, uh, sharing that event shows the reason why he is so resolute and he's so firm in his desire to actually take this action but that will be in the next video all right thank you all keep uh annotating and analyzing um and we'll fill you in with the next section soon